The scene changes to a few days later, where Mike Heil informs Davlos that their mission is accomplished. The residents are free from indoctrination. Davlos expresses heartfelt gratitude towards Mike Heil for his assistance. Feeling indebted, Davlos asks how he can repay such a favor, recognizing Mike Heil's heroic deeds. Mike Heil reassures Davlos, telling him there's no need for repayment. Davlos, however, feels unworthy of his position as village chief, believing himself to be a creation of evil forces. In response, Mike Heil acknowledges Davlos's role in bringing the village together and managing its people, surprising Davlos with this recognition. Despite Davlos's capabilities, Mike Heil insists that the current situation cannot continue. The village needs someone capable of leading them into a better future. Davlos, intrigued, questions if Mike Heil is referring to a higher power. Mike Heil confirms Davlos's suspicion, acknowledging the village's painful history under such authority. Then, Davlos raises a critical question. Will the residents accept the changes? Mike Heil responds thoughtfully, acknowledging that Davlos's concern isn't unfounded. He explains that with the eradication of indoctrination, the protective barrier against monsters will weaken, leaving the village vulnerable to their return. In essence, the poison that kept the monsters at bay will dissipate, inviting their resurgence. Seeking reassurance, Davlos inquires about a solution. Mike Heil admits that instead of a clear-cut remedy, he has a plan to shoulder the responsibility. Though he can't disclose the details immediately, he implores Davlos to have faith in him. Curiosity gnawing at him, Davlos presses further, questioning Mike Heil's motivations. With a hint of enigmatic sincerity, Mike Heil deflects, asking whether he truly needs a reason. The scene shifts to the depths of the forest, where Mike Heil channels his purification spell, enveloping the land in divine light. He muses that this gradual purification process will cleanse the tainted earth. Suddenly, Set interrupts, estimating that the contamination should be resolved within a year. Yet, he solemnly acknowledges the inevitable truth. Mike Heil cannot remain tethered to this place indefinitely. As the realization dawns that Mike Heil's role cannot be sustained indefinitely, he confides in Set, revealing his lineage as the heir of the prestigious house of Valpurgis. Acknowledging the family's resources in terms of wealth and manpower, Mike Heil cryptically suggests that the unfolding events will naturally resolve the rest. Set struggles to grasp the implications of Mike Heil's words when suddenly, Leon arrives in haste. Mike Heil, intrigued by the urgency in Leon's demeanor, inquires about the commotion. Leon reveals the arrival of a figure of high stature, emphasizing their significance. A spark of anticipation lights up Mike Heil's expression as he muses over the identity of this eminent visitor. With a playful grin, Mike Heil directs Leon to turn around, revealing the imposing presence of Duke Linden. In a moment of surprise, Duke Linden warmly greets Leon, noting his growth with approval. Leon, taken aback by the unexpected encounter, queries how Duke Linden managed to approach unnoticed. With a twinkle in his eye, Duke Linden reveals that he had been shadowing Leon all along. The scene transitions to the confines of a chamber, where Mike Heil confronts Duke Linden, curiosity evident in his expression. Inquiring about the reason for Duke Linden's presence in such a remote locale, Mike Heil receives a straightforward response. His Majesty's summons prompted Duke Linden's visit. Initially slated for a lower-ranking envoy, Duke Linden's interest was piqued, leading him to undertake the journey himself. Amused by the notion of Duke Linden's potential boredom prompting the visit, Mike Heil ponders the implications. However, Duke Linden swiftly redirects the conversation, emphasizing the altered circumstances. With Mike Heil now recognized as a hero by the divine powers, the situation has evolved. Seeking clarity, Mike Heil probes the significance of this formal recognition. Duke Linden, displaying impatience, urges them to move past pleasantries and delve into the heart of the matter. Mike Heil, sensing the weight of Duke Linden's words, wonders if this is an extension of His Majesty's desires. Duke Linden reassures Mike Heil, citing his pivotal role in neutralizing threats to the Empire as justification for the forthcoming reward. Yet, Mike Heil hesitates, expressing reluctance to become entangled in the caprices of His Majesty's court. In response to Duke Linden's words, Mike Heil listens intently, considering the weight of his decision. Duke Linden underscores Mike Heil's status as a hero, 
hinting at the potential ramifications should he decline his majesty's summons. Curious about Duke Linden's perspective, Mikhail seeks his opinion on the matter. With a measured tone, Duke Linden acknowledges Mikhail's evident talent but cautions that his majesty's viewpoint might differ. Mikhail reflects on this, recalling snippets from his past life where talent was highly valued by the empire, especially during times of prosperity before the machinations altered the course of history. When Duke Linden presses for a decision, Mikhail responds with a blend of resolve and humility, dismissing any need for pretense in Duke Linden's presence. As a hero, Mikhail solemnly proclaims his allegiance to the sanctum, catching Duke Linden off guard. Surprised by the sudden declaration, Duke Linden probes further, questioning the spontaneity of Mikhail's announcement. Unfazed, Mikhail stands firm, asserting his desire for autonomy and independence in his actions. Stunned by Mikhail's bold assertion, Duke Linden can't help but question whether Mikhail truly comprehends the weight of his words. Unwavering, Mikhail assures him that he does indeed understand. This apparent lack of intimidation from Mikhail surprises Duke Linden. Concerned for Mikhail's well-being, Duke Linden presses further, questioning if Mikhail still seeks autonomy despite the potential consequences. With a steely resolve, Mikhail explains that if this were any ordinary territory, he wouldn't be making such demands. Turning the conversation to military strategy, Mikhail asks Duke Linden to consider the necessary force for defending the territory. Duke Linden estimates a baronial-level force should suffice, but Mikhail counters, explaining that without adequate preparation, they'd require a military presence equivalent to that of a duchy or even a marquisate. Duke Linden balks at the suggestion, deeming it impossible given the potential threat of demons. But Mikhail remains steadfast, asserting that their adversaries aren't merely human. It's not just about the size of their auras or the amount of mana they possess. Demons fundamentally differ from humans in ways that demand a unique approach to defense. As Mikhail contemplates the nature of these insidious demons, he's struck by their relentless and malevolent essence, a truth often overlooked by many. Turning to Duke Linden, he stresses the necessity for a different approach in dealing with these creatures compared to humans. Duke Linden acknowledges this distinction, but fails to see the link to self-governance. Instead, he outlines his plan to bolster their defenses locally to combat the demon threat. Curious, Mikhail probes further, asking if Duke Linden intends to dispatch demon hunters to their region. Considering the suggestion, Mikhail muses that granting autonomy could provide the empire with an effective restraint against the demon incursions. Duke Linden finds merit in Mikhail's idea, yet cautions that the final decision rests with the emperor. Despite this, Mikhail remains confident trusting his understanding of the emperor's inclinations. Encouraging patience, he suggests they await the emperor's response. The scene transitions outdoors, where Mikhail seeks out Kassar. With genuine concern, Mikhail inquires about Kassar's well-being. Kassar responds with a faint affirmation, admitting there's much to grapple with. Sensing a deeper conflict within Kassar, Mikhail broaches the subject of breaking free from the curse of immortality. Kassar confides in Mikhail, expressing a desire to be liberated, but also acknowledging the daunting prospect of returning to mere humanity. Mikhail suggests an alternative path for Kassar, becoming a hunter. Kassar's willingness to pursue vengeance against the demon intrigues Mikhail. Reflecting on the concept of vengeance, Mikhail realizes that if channeled constructively, it can provide purpose and motivation. However, he understands the delicate balance needed to prevent it from consuming one's soul. Assuring Kassar of his support, Mikhail reveals his plan to transform the land into a haven for hunters, offering a tangible means for Kassar to pursue his revenge. Intrigued, Kassar seeks clarification on how Mikhail intends to assist him. In response, Mikhail lays out his vision, outlining how they'll collaborate to establish a domain dedicated to hunters a beacon of hope in the face of darkness. As preparations for the impending demon invasion intensify, Mikhail finds himself deep in negotiations with the emperor. Sensing the weight of responsibility, Kassar turns to Mikhail, questioning whether Mikhail intends to entrust him with the leadership of the hunters. Mikhail's response is tinged with genuine respect and admiration for Kassar. He expresses a desire to see Kassar take on the role, if circumstances permit. Kassar, however, harbors doubts 
revealing his lineage as the son of Draculian, the very figure responsible for past disasters. Yet, Mikhail's judgment remains steadfast. He reassures Kassar that his worth is not defined by his lineage, but by his actions and character. Mikhail's unwavering belief in Kassar's courage and determination stuns him. Encouraged by Mikhail's faith, Kassar straightens his posture, affirming his willingness to shoulder the responsibility. In that moment, Mikhail sees in Kassar a righteousness surpassing all others. Reflecting on past lifetimes where Kassar's fate was met with tragedy, Mikhail is determined that this time will be different. He believes Kassar will endure, fulfilling the purpose of his existence with unwavering resolve. A purpose, Mikhail concludes, that is sure to be fulfilled. The scene shifts to the grandeur of the emperor's palace, where Theseus observes Alexandro, the reigning emperor of the vast empire. Theseus, his mind fraught with concern, notes the complexity of the situation before him. Originally, the swordsman and the magician were to be dealt with separately, but now, they've inexplicably merged into one entity. Even the emperor himself hadn't foreseen this turn of events, making predictions increasingly challenging. Expressing his dissatisfaction, the emperor voices his displeasure, seeking counsel from Duke Valpurgis. Duke Valpurgis, known for his wisdom, acknowledges the gravity of the situation, remarking that it's now beyond the emperor's control. The emperor raises a pertinent point, highlighting that the mage in question is the son of the duke. In response, Duke Valpurgis offers insight into Mikhail's character, describing him as somewhat uncontrollable, a trait not uncommon in youth. He emphasizes that the identity of the hero matters less than the reality that a new hero has emerged, signaling an end to the fragile peace that once prevailed. Upon hearing Duke Valpurgis's words, the emperor's expression darkens. He recalls the duke's earlier mention of a growing demon threat within the capital, a fact that deeply unsettles him. Duke Valpurgis, ever the voice of reason, acknowledges the futility of attempting to predict the hero's actions. In response, the emperor, his tone tinged with frustration, asserts his understanding that a hero cannot be controlled. Yet, driven by a sense of possessiveness, he reveals his decision to leave a mark that would deter anyone from interfering with the hero. Duke Valpurgis surmises that the emperor is referring to the autonomous territory. Affirming this, the emperor underscores the importance of Duke Valpurgis's paternal role and hints at an owed debt. In light of this, Duke Valpurgis has taken a step back from intervening. Eager to understand the emperor's intentions, Duke Valpurgis implores him to clarify his desires. The scene shifts to Kassar standing before the palace, awaiting Mikhail's arrival. As Mikhail approaches, he shares the news that His Majesty has granted permission, officially designating the land as belonging to the House of Valpurgis, an esteemed autonomous territory known as the Holy Autonomous Territory. In a moment charged with significance, Mikhail entrusts Kassar with a pivotal role, offering him leadership among the hunters and the position of acting lord. Handing Kassar a gleaming emblem, Mikhail explains that it's a magical tool he crafted himself, designed to conceal Kassar's true identity as Draculian. With this emblem, Kassar can move freely without fear of being discovered. Kassar, impressed by the craftsmanship, inquires if Mikhail created the magical tool himself. Mikhail confirms this, emphasizing that while he's been entrusted with the land, he harbors no desire for ownership or interference. Instead, he envisions the territory as a sanctuary, a home and base for hunters. With determination etched into his features, Mikhail declares his intent to shape the land into a place truly suited for hunters, a haven where they can thrive and pursue their noble cause. Mikhail's plan involves an extended stay to oversee the development of the land, prompting him to assign Kassar the task of locating hidden hunters during this period. Kassar is taken aback by the unexpected request. The scene shifts to Mikhail's chamber, where Leon and the butler react with astonishment to the news of their prolonged stay in the territory, lasting three to four months. Expressing concern, Leon questions the duration, but Mikhail assures him that it's necessary to lay the groundwork for the territory's future. He emphasizes that this time frame is relatively short for such an undertaking. Furthermore, Mikhail reveals his intention to engage in serious training during their stay. Both Leon and the butler are surprised by this directive. 
Mikhail acknowledges Leon's significant growth and strength since they first met, but believes there's still room for improvement. He encourages Leon to seize the opportunity for further training. Leon, understanding Mikhail's implication, expresses his readiness to utilize the stay as a chance for intensive training and self-improvement. Mikhail addresses Leon, reassuring him that he won't need to fret over those who are capable of handling themselves, implying that he won't micromanage. Instead, he urges Leon to focus on his own growth, encouraging him to become stronger. In response, Leon queries if Mikhail has anything specific planned for him. Mikhail's response is pragmatic. He points out that the land is teeming with monsters, suggesting that Leon use them as training targets. Encouraged, Leon pledges to become stronger, relieving Mikhail of any concerns about his progress. Turning his attention to the butler, Mikhail is surprised by the butler's readiness to listen and learn. The butler explains that while he may excel in magical circles, Mikhail's utilization of the eighth circle surpasses his own abilities. Accepting this with grace, Mikhail proposes a straightforward solution and, with a smile, invites the butler to join him for a run, signaling the beginning of their training regimen. The butler's surprise is evident as Mikhail shares his perspective on the importance of physical fitness. Stressing the adage that a healthy body houses a healthy mind, Mikhail encourages the butler to embrace their running routine wholeheartedly. Acknowledging the butler's potential, Mikhail recalls a previous occasion where the butler demonstrated determination by running alongside a horse despite his magical abilities. The butler attributes this effort to Mikhail's instruction, but Mikhail assures him that he values the butler's dedication greatly. With a mischievous smirk, Mikhail playfully questions whether the butler would be willing to repeat the task if asked again, hinting at the continuation of their training regimen. The scene transitions outdoors as Kassar bids farewell to Mikhail, expressing his intention to reunite in a few months' time. Mikhail observes Kassar's swift departure, noting his refusal of support despite Mikhail's offer. However, Mikhail remains unperturbed, confident in Kassar's abilities. Recalling Kassar's past achievements as the leader of the Demon Hunters, Mikhail reflects on his formidable reputation and skills. With vengeance and hunter prowess at his disposal, Kassar embodies a potent force against the looming threat of demons. As Kassar departs, Mikhail shifts his focus to the task at hand, farming. Set, curious about the feasibility of this endeavor, questions Mikhail. With a hint of amusement, Mikhail dismisses Set's doubt as he outlines his plan. Explaining that the process won't involve any elaborate methods this time, Mikhail reveals his strategy. Initially, they will consolidate the residents' living space, effectively managing the area. Subsequently, they'll work on diminishing the monster population and fortifying the compressed zone with protective magic. Set acknowledges Mikhail's plan as a pragmatic approach, but raises a concern regarding potential neglect, suggesting it could lead back to square one. Mikhail, however, reassures Set, denying any intent of neglect. With a swift incantation, Mikhail conjures forth the seed of the world tree, prompting Set's astonishment. Set questions why Mikhail possesses such a unique seed in its intact form, knowing the world tree to be singular in existence. Mikhail clarifies that it's not the genuine seed, but a replica significantly modified for mass production. Tossing the replica seeds onto the barren ground, Mikhail demonstrates their capabilities. Though their performance is average, they boast rapid growth and expansive spread. Instantly, the seeds sprout into flourishing trees, transforming the once desolate land. Set, amazed by the spectacle, queries when Mikhail managed to create these replicas. Mikhail reveals that he conducted some analysis upon discovering the world tree, leading to their creation. In Mikhail's mind, he recognizes the replicated seed as a relic from before his regression, a downgraded version limited in production and lifespan, lasting no more than a year and unable to be spread again. Yet, Mikhail deems it sufficient to cover the territory for the next year and appreciates its ability to suppress demons. Set inquires about the management of the territory, prompting Mikhail to mention Nephthys' offer of assistance. Set then asks about a name for the seeds to which Mikhail admits he hadn't given much thought. He suggests Dream Tree, but Set finds it dull. The scene shifts to a few days later, where Mikhail communicates with his father through a magical call. 
Mikhail informs his father that the time has come. In response, Mikhail's father expresses regret that if Mikhail weren't his child, Mikhail reassures his father to not hold back, as he had promised full support. With evident frustration, Duke Valporgis voices his support for Mikhail but expresses disappointment that Mikhail hadn't discussed the establishment of an autonomous region with him beforehand. Mikhail responds by suggesting that his father should be accustomed to such decisions by now. Duke Valporgis laments his inability to reprimand Mikhail from a distance, acknowledging the pressure imposed by the emperor. Mikhail presses for details about the emperor's demands, prompting Duke Valporgis to reveal that the emperor won't directly pressure Mikhail, recognizing his importance as the hero. However, the emperor has requested a meeting in the capital, adding to Mikhail's concerns. Upon hearing this, Mikhail anticipates some complications ahead. Despite the impending headache, he rationalizes that nothing problematic is likely to occur in his absence. With this in mind, Mikhail decides that a visit to the capital might be unavoidable. The scene transitions to the butler engaged in training, honing his skills. Suddenly, Mikhail interrupts, informing the butler of his imminent departure to the capital. He reassures the butler that it won't be a lengthy absence, but he entrusts the butler with overseeing affairs in his absence. Surprised by the sudden news, the butler inquires about Mikhail's reason for visiting the capital. Mikhail casually explains that he's simply meeting with the emperor, downplaying the significance of the encounter. The scene shifts to a carriage where Set accompanies Mikhail. Set comments on the comfort of the journey and remarks on Mikhail's rare ventures outside. Mikhail acknowledges that he seldom travels alone, prompting Set to disclose the recent changes she's experienced due to Mikhail's growing holy power. Intrigued, Mikhail queries Set about these changes. Set, in response, assumes a human form, surprising Mikhail. He admits the unexpected nature of the transformation, indicating his intrigue at Set's newfound ability. Mikhail reflects on the process of infusing divine power into Set's body, noting that it seems to have inadvertently brought about healing effects for himself as well. Curious about the duration of this phenomenon, Mikhail questions Set, who responds that it lasts approximately 30 minutes per day. Intrigued by Set's newfound abilities, Mikhail queries about any additional functions. Set demonstrates by swinging her arm to the left, causing a noticeable decrease in the energy of the monsters surrounding their carriage. Astonished, Mikhail presses Set for an explanation. Set reveals that she attempted to target the monsters with a storm as a test, resulting in only half of them being affected. She muses that this performance falls short of her prime capabilities. Mikhail, puzzled, admits he has no recollection of hearing about Set's prime. Set clarifies that her prime refers to a state of perfect condition, likening it to the legendary Age of Gods. Although she and others like her weren't gods, they were vastly superior beings compared to present-day humanity. Upon hearing Set's explanation, Mikhail's mind whirls with thoughts of divine beings. He contemplates the insignificance of terms like Grand Master Ninth Circle in the presence of such entities. Humanity's struggle to gather divine relics stems from the belief that possessing power on par with these beings would enable them to defeat the demon god. Mikhail finds the situation incomprehensible. How could a civilization teeming with such powerful beings have succumbed to downfall?